of social isolation, we continue our video service in hopes that you will find some sense of community, that you will be spiritually nurtured, that you will be reminded of God's constant love and providential care, and that you will know that you still belong, body, mind, and spirit, to the family of faith. We must acknowledge from the beginning that this will not feel like the Palm Sunday services that we are used to, but it does not diminish the special importance of this day. Know that we still celebrate the triumphal entry of Jesus with Christians around the world, perhaps more connected with a larger community of faith in these days than we have ever been in our lifetimes, as the whole world shares a unique experience. In the interest of preserving as much of our worship service as possible, we are adding communion to today's service, the first Sunday of the month, as we usually do. However, since we are not physically together, communion must be done just a bit differently from what we are used to. I encourage you to take a moment or two to gather some communion supplies for yourself. It is okay if you do not have wine or grape juice and bread. Jesus chose elements that were common to nearly every meal in order that he could be remembered every time we eat and drink. So in this time when what is common has changed and might be different for everyone, gather what you have and treat it with the same respect and reverence you would use for the elements of communion in worship when we are gathered together in person. Pause the recording to gather your supplies. When you have gathered your supplies, just hit play again and follow along. Instructions will be provided at the time of communion. Now let us prepare our hearts as we listen to the prelude.
The response for today's call to worship will be Hosanna in the highest. I will motion when it is time to respond as well as speaking the response with you. I encourage you to say the words aloud just as you would if you were here in the sanctuary. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Hosanna to God. Hosanna in the highest. Let Israel say his love endures forever, and all who serve God say his love endures forever. Hosanna to God. Hosanna in the highest. With the Lord on our side, what can we fear? What can humankind do? Hosanna to God. Hosanna in the highest. We shall triumph over that which threatens us and stand in confidence in the Lord our God. Hosanna to God. Hosanna in the highest. The Lord is our strength and our might. The Lord is our salvation. Hosanna to God. Hosanna in the highest. Would you pray with me? In most years, Lord, it is relatively easy for us to order palm leaves and wave them in church. Most years, we easily find music and a few good words to help us remember and reenact Palm Sunday. But this year is different. We must think differently and celebrate differently and worship in new ways. So we ask, what if you arrived in the midst of a pandemic inviting us to lay down something important to us? What if we felt the imminence of the danger that accompanied you or sensed that authorities were watching where we went? How then, Jesus, would we meet you today and what would we spread before you? How would we regard humility from the one we hope will save the world? Palm Sunday, Jesus. Help us to see how and where you enter our world today and what you ask us to lay at your feet and how we may welcome you in. Amen. Our scripture readings this morning are familiar. We hear the words of Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, nearly every year on Palm Sunday. And each year we listen to the story of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem to celebrate Passover with his disciples as crowds line the streets in a frenzy of celebrity. This year, we read the story from Luke's Gospel, the longest and most detailed of the accounts. I urge you to listen to and truly hear the word of God for you this day. From Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And from Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 41. After Jesus said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Say, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent went ahead and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the coat, the owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is an odd Palm Sunday worship indeed this day. On a day that is all about crowds, while we are in a time of social isolation, we grieve the loss of beloved rituals. This year there will be no waving of palms in our sanctuary or poking people with them in the hallways. There will be no palm crosses made while the preacher drones on, no soaring anthems, no collective voices filling the church with favorite hymns sung only this one day a year. But perhaps that is okay for this one year. Perhaps this is a time to reflect on doing things differently from how we have always done them. Reconsidering old habits, gaining greater appreciation for things we too often take for granted. Perhaps this is a time to take a different kind of look at these familiar words. And next year, God willing, we will return to our beloved ritual with a renewed sense of enthusiastic appreciation. When the Lord entered Jerusalem, the crowd was celebrating. It was time for the annual feast of Passover. This week marked the time for Passover in our own world, too. But instead of crowds gathering in the streets of Jerusalem and our Jerusalem, Jewish friends gathering in crowds in their home to share the Seder meal as Jews have done for millennia. The streets are empty and only families gather, still keeping the ritual, sharing the ancient words and symbolic foods, but some may fear even opening the front door for Elijah to be welcomed. It is not just Christian celebrations that have been disrupted. Yet disruption was part of Palm Sunday and of the Last Supper, which was a Passover Seder as well. Disruption is, in fact, a hallmark of the Christian faith. We are not meant to go about doing things as we have always done them. Instead, we are meant to live differently because of what Jesus said and taught, and most importantly, because of what he did. Mary's miraculous pregnancy was a disruption. The census being taken when it was time for Jesus' birth was a disruption. The birth in a place meant for animals was a disruption. The angels appearing to shepherds, the shepherds leaving their sheep, the wise men traveling from the east bringing gifts, the holy family's flight to Egypt, the slaughter of the innocents, all were disruptions. The only story that we have of Jesus as a boy was a disruption since his parents had to backtrack to the temple to find him. Jesus' teaching in the temple when he was only about 12 years old was a disruption. John preaching and baptizing in the desert to prepare the way of the Lord was a disruption. And Jesus showing up to be baptized was a just disruption as well as his flight into the wilderness where the temptations were a disruption to him. The gathering of the disciples was a disruption in their lives and in their communities and the crowds that followed Jesus and showed up wherever he was. The people healed, the demons cast out, those raised from the dead, all disruptions. The things Jesus taught were a disruption, too, of the expectations society that had long awaited the Messiah and the end of Roman rule who could not control the crowds. Why should the entry into Jerusalem be anything other than disruptive? In fact, in some ways, this was one of the least disruptive parts of Jesus' ministry. The entry into Jerusalem occurred with Jesus on a donkey. While this was a disruption of the expected warrior king, an itinerant prophet showing up on a beast of burden really shouldn't have caused much fuss. There had been itinerant prophets throughout the history of God's people, and showing up for the Passover celebration in Jerusalem was an expectation of any Jews who could get there. So that wouldn't have been a big surprise either. Sure, 
The fact that the donkey was borrowed in a rather unusual fashion might have raised the eyebrow of the owner, but it's not like there was a sign around its neck proclaiming it a donkey of unusual borrowing. Really, there wasn't much earthly reason for Jesus traveling to Jerusalem to cause such a stir, but it did, and that made all the difference. The religious leaders and Romans could no longer control the crowds who ran out into the street, ripping down tree limbs and spreading even their own clothing on the road in honor of Jesus. This was crowd acknowledgement of him as an honored ruler, a signal of the treason he never committed, but for which he was tried and condemned to death. Things had gotten out of hand with this disruption and the time for doing things as they had been doing them for some time was at an end. The time for sweeping change had come and life would never be the same. The world would never be the same. We have spent our whole lives with this story, not really questioning it much. Maybe we learn some new bits of information here and there over the years, but we have not experienced the sort of disruption that Jesus' entry into Jerusalem and the events that followed it kicked off. We have not experienced the rather unbelievable spread of something so new it turned society as we know it on its head, at least not on a worldwide scale. But we are experiencing something world-changing now. And while the events are very different, and the outcome will not be on the same scale as eternal salvation that resulted from the disruption that was the life and ministry of Jesus, the world will not go back to being as it was before. After the triumphal entry that set the events of Holy Week into motion, leaders fell out of power and other leaders were raised up. The teachings of love and kindness, peace and compassion, care for those in need, and the sharing of resources among people far and wide came into being. Even with genuine persecution, there was no stopping this good news and the life changes that came with it. Loving God above all else and loving neighbor as self spread beyond those who had previously been part of the family of faith, beyond the confines of the Jewish community and out into the world. Saint and sinner alike, rich and poor, Roman and Jew mixed together now in a new way of living, a new form of faith that did not discriminate against even those society would shun. The current world situation We will come to an end, though it might seem rather endless as we live it. The lockdowns and travel restrictions will end. Businesses will reopen, though not all the ones we knew. And there will be some we did not have before. When that day comes, surely we will celebrate. But how will we move on into life? Will we be like the Pharisees and Sadducees who try to force everything back into the old version of normal? Will we fall away, as so many of the crowd who cried Hosanna did, going back to whatever we can that is safe and familiar? Or will we be like those early believers, followers of the way, even before the term Christian was coined in any language? Will we share the love and peace of God boldly and without fear? Will we act with kindness and compassion, sharing what we have with those in need? Will we take a chance on following new leaders who have also been changed? Will we truly put love of God above all else and love our neighbors as ourselves? Our lives have been disrupted, just as the lives of the disciples and religious leaders and Roman rulers and new believers and so many others were disrupted by the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. And we have an amazing and unique chance to kind of hit a reset button in our lives, evaluating our priorities while holed up in our homes so that we will be ready when we are once again free. Use this disruption to choose how you will live into the freedom and grace of life as a believer 
and into the freedom and grace that will come when this terrible pandemic is at an end. And may you be safe and well and blessed. Amen. Would you pray with me? In the spirit of recognizing that this is a worldwide event and a holy time for faiths other than our own, I sought out prayers from different denominations and even different religions and took pieces from a variety of prayers to create the prayer I am about to pray with you. May it be your will, O God, God of our fathers and mothers, that we go in peace and return in peace safe from the ancient hazards of travel, enemies, thieves, ambushes, and wild beasts, and safe from modern perils, plane crashes, and train wrecks, scammers, and con artists, infectious disease, and quarantine, so that our travel, when truly necessary, serves its highest purpose. And when we reach our destination and return home in joy, life, and health, Grant us grace in your eyes and in the eyes of all whom we meet. Rock of ages, bring an end to disease and suffering so that all may know your compassion and grace. God of the present moment, God who in Jesus stills the storm and soothes the frantic heart, bring hope and courage to all who wait or work in uncertainty. Bring hope that you will make them the equal of whatever lies ahead. Bring them courage to endure what cannot be avoided, for your will is health and wholeness. You are God, and we need you. Jesus Christ, healer of all, stay by our side in this time of uncertainty and sorrow. Be with those who have died from the virus. May they be at rest with you in your eternal peace. Be with the families of those who are sick or have died. As they worry and grieve, defend them from illness and despair. May they know your peace. Be with the doctors, nurses, researchers, and all medical professionals who seek to heal and help those affected and who put themselves at risk in the process. May they know your protection and peace. Be with the leaders of all nations. Give them the foresight to act with charity and true concern for the well-being of the people they are meant to serve. Give them wisdom to invest in long-term solutions that will help prepare for future outbreaks or prevent them altogether. May they know your peace as they work together to achieve it on earth. Whether we are home alone, surrounded by many people or only a few, Stay with us as we endure and mourn, persist and prepare. In place of our anxiety, give us your peace. Blessed are you, Lord, who hears our prayer. Amen. Before we have communion, I want to take a moment to remind you that this is the time in our regular service when we remember the many blessings God has given us and respond in thanks by the giving of our tithes and offerings. If you are able, please remember to mail in your tithes and offerings to the church office even during this shutdown so the church will be able to continue and function through and after this crisis has passed. Now we have come to the time for communion. If you didn't already get some form of communion elements to consume, something to drink and something to eat, please pause the recording and do so now. I will share words of invitation and blessing over the elements we are all using for communion, whatever they may be. We'll recite the words of institution, and then we'll ask that we eat whatever bread of life we are using together when I say the body of Christ broken for you and then pause before we drink together whatever cup of salvation we are using when I say the blood of Christ shed for you. After that, we will have a communion prayer followed by your weekly homework and a blessing. And then we'll have the privilege once again of hearing Catholic play a postlude. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for communion together as we listen to Kathy play.
time that we come together from every land as one great family of God sharing a family meal together. All who are seeking connection with God are welcome to participate, to be fed as beloved children of God. Let us pray. God of all times and all places, all lands and nations, we come before you now asking your blessing on these elements we are about to consume. Whatever it be that we may take in, we ask that you will set it aside from ordinary purpose to your own divine purpose, consecrating it for our use to nourish not only our bodies, but also our spirits. Through these elements and the familiar words, lift us into your presence in a way that is different from ordinary days, uniting us with you and with all believers in every time and place throughout history and into the future that we may truly all be one family of God. Let us feel your presence as we take in what you proclaimed to be your body and blood on that night so long ago. Fill us with your own breath that we may sense your Holy Spirit living in us. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took a bread, and after giving thanks to the Father, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup when they had supped and gave it to them, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. The body of Christ, broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Eternal God, in this unusual time and these very unusual circumstances, we thank you for the opportunity to share in this foretaste of the great banquet we will one day share in heaven. We thank you for the nourishment of our bodies and our minds and our spirits this day. And we ask that you would help us to carry this sense of your presence and the sense of connectedness into the rest of our lives, holding fast to the communion and the community until we are gathered in person once more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I thank you for joining us in this unusual Palm Sunday worship. Your homework this week is to write down where you see God at work today. It need not be a lengthy essay, nor complete sentences or correct grammar for that matter. Just a list is fine. You don't even need to explain. And it's okay if there's only one thing on your list. But please write it down. And then, and this is important, Email me your list no later than Monday, April 6th at noon. My email address is pastortwyla at gmail.com. Now, 
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen.